Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Dying with Diabetes in America, our tongue-in-cheek version of talking about experiences and all the ups and downs of diabetic life. I am Michelle Robinson, and I am here with my co-host, the brains of the operation, Mike Herlihy. I am taking no responsibility for this. <laughs> None. How are you doing? It's It's been an okay day. I'm still fighting with every entity possible to get test strips and to get insulin. So that's a lot of fun. I was going to say, it's, it's, it's been a few weeks now since it's I think a I- month. I, I was I talked to you one day and you said mm-hmm. you were excited because you should be getting your Libre test stuff in and now it's gone from getting your Libre to you can't even get a glucometer with the proper yeah. test strips, right? Well, and I don't want to get a glucometer because if I get a glucometer, if they cover that, they're not going to cover the sensors anymore. So it's right. like because the nurse totally offered that and I was like, listen, I know this is going to shoot myself in the foot. We're just not going to do it that way. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's it's fighting. It's fighting with everybody with prior auths, and you call the vendor, and the vendor blames the insurance company, and the insurance company blames lack of clinic notes or no mm-hmm. prior auth. It's it's oh, well, I'm, I'm time. sorry. I'm sorry you've been going through that still, but I mean that's kind of exactly what we've been talking about week in and week out mm-hmm. here. And uh, speaking of that, you were really excited about the guest you have this week. Uh, I've I never, am. I've never met this lady, but you were so excited that she agreed to do this. Uh, well, you go ahead and introduce her. Well, I want you to meet our guest, Colleen. <laughs> Colleen. Now I'm going to massacre your last name, so I'm going to take a shot. But Nick. Yes, actually, that's exactly it. <laughs> wow! <When> I, Congratulations. <laughs> Not what I would have gone with. But. You know, you know, you try. So, mm-hmm. Khalid and I met each other on a mutual diabetic support group on Facebook, and when I had put out that this was something that I really wanted to go with, what I loved about Colleen was she got the humor. She wasn't immediately <laughs> like, "Oh my God, you're the worst person ever." You, but she understood. You know how many people, uh, when we first started with the name, reached out <laughs> message wise. This is just horrible. I've been a diabetic for forty plus years. And the fact that you would, and then they listen to a couple episodes and they're like, hey, just wanted to say, I really like what you yeah. guys are doing. I'm like, well, th- what did you think we were going to be talking about? Like, I, I think, I think a lot of people from the name judge we were going to be like some goth group that listens to the cure and <laughs> paints hey, everything black, hey, which hey, hey, hey. I love cure. the cure. But I mean, really, what did they think? I know. But enough about enough about and, that. And it's Back not to like we were, oh my God, dying, you know, from yeah. diabetes. We put that, we we're dying with. With exactly. Okay, so, so, so Colleen. So, yes. Colleen had that kind of sense of humor that automatically you thought would be a good fit. She understood my dark tendencies of humor, yes. so it was great. <laughs> Love so, it. So, Colleen, where are you from? So, I'm from Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Oh, nice. Nice, beautiful area. I love Massachusetts. Yeah. I've only really been to uh, Boston because I'm a really touristy, touristy person. And then Plymouth. I've been to Plymouth a couple of okay. times. So I guess that also makes me a touristy, touristy person. <laughs> but um, so uh, have you have you lived in Mass all your life? Yes. Okay. And how old were you when you were diagnosed with diabetes? So I was the ripe old age of 13 months old. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So you were out there playing with your building blocks and you said, what can I do to make life harder? This yeah. is just too. <laughs> I, just I too really look forward to needles. To deal with. Yeah. Oh my God. Now, are you an only child or were you, where do you fall in your family? So I'm the oldest. I have a younger brother. Oh, okay. Why and they decided to try this again? I have no idea. It, <laughs> Is is he di- does diabetes run in your family, or are yeah. you the uh, golden goose over there? I'm the golden goose. I'm oh. the one that pulled all the short straws. Oh wow! Absolutely. Wow. So 13 months old. Uh, usually we say, what, "What did it feel like when you were diagnosed?" But at 13 <laughs> months, I'm imagining this is this is literally the only life you've ever known, right? Yes. So yeah, any memory? How how old were you when you first realized you weren't? Let, that every other kid didn't have to do needles every day and stuff like that. So probably I can recall as early as preschool going down to um, like the nurse's office and telling her, oh, like I have diabetes. And my mom was <laughs> present too. I have diabetes and this is what I do. And I prick my finger and I give myself juice and this is how many carbs. Wow. And the nurse was like, I don't know 
why you need me, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. So, I mean, you were, you've been well read on this and, you know, with it for God. Yeah. How many years have you had it? If you don't mind saying. Um, it'll be 30 years in September. Congratulations. Very, well, it's crazy. Now, your parents, like, did they just, you know, did you keep coming up and, and getting water? I mean, did, did they just see a difference when that so, happened? So what happened was both my parents are actually in the medical field. My dad was wow. a podiatrist, now he's a teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and my mom was a certified occupational therapy assistant. Um and so both of them were well versed in you know, the medical field. And mm -hmm. um, when I was, I want to say it was around a year old, I got sick with either they thought it was a like cold or the flu. And then it just never went away. And I continued to get sicker and sicker, um, kept losing weight. I was premature anyway. So I was always, I was already tiny. Mm -hmm. And then adding on the diabetes and losing weight. I was soaking through diapers, apparently. Mm -hmm. um, they took me to the doctor over and over. I want to say they took me three or four times. And at one point, my mom called the on-call doc and was like, there is something wrong with my child. This, this isn't right. And he told her to never call him again over a cold. Wow. So... My grandmother finally took me to another doctor I, out of network or something. Mm -hmm. um, and in the 15 minute car ride from her house to the doctor's office, I drank like a huge sippy cup filled with half juice, half water, mm -hmm. which they didn't know was right. added to the problem. And then when I got to the doctor's office, I was pulling at the faucet to try to get more water. And so my grandmother says, like, this isn't right. She's drinking so much and she's getting mm -hmm. sick. Like, there's something wrong. So he finally does a blood stick. My blood sugar mm -hmm. was something like 1,800. And Jesus. Was, wow. Like, okay. So you're going to the emergency room at this time. <laughs> do not pass go. <laughs> right, do not pass go. Um, and so, you know, before cell phones and everything. So my grandma yeah. was trying to call my mom. <laughs> my mom trying to get a hold of my dad. They met us at one of the local hospitals. They stabilized us. And then I got shipped up to Jocelyn. Okay. And actually at Jocelyn Diabetes Center in Boston, um, I was at the time the mm -hmm. youngest diagnosed with type 1 diabetes that did not have a family history. There was a young boy who beat me by a month. Oh, uh, <laughs> but they don't, they don't give you any trophies or anything for that. It's like no, you guys are in all these records, no checks, and like, be great. You got one of those big, perks. yeah, one of those right. big checks that doesn't even fit in the car, like in Happy <laughs> Gilmore. Ah, oh, that'd be great. But instead, it seems like no matter what you do with diabetes, it still just sucks. That's yes. like, that's ridiculous. So, how, how has it been for you? Is it something that you found, uh, like one of the few people I know uh, that had type one or has type one is Michelle. And I've seen her life just go severe highs, severe lows. And then we've had other people on the show that have been able to manage it without any real like, yeah, it's an inconvenience. How has your life been with it? Like, is it something that you find manageable or is it something that you have to fight every day? So I have a, I have a wild ride. Um, <laughs> on top of being the short straw in the family, I also pulled the short straw, I think, in diabetes land. <laughs> so I actually have um, an allergy to the preservative in insulin. And so it causes, no matter what type of insulin, no matter what temperature, room temp, out of the fridge, it causes severe burning underneath oh. my skin whenever I bolus. Oh. And so when I was like... 14 or 15 when I switched from the MDI to the pump, um, I started to notice that pain more and more. And so I kind of faded away from giving myself insulin because who wants to be in pain? Yeah. And I don't know anyone else in the world because you know <laughs> social media isn't as big as it is now. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and so for years. I restricted how much insulin I was giving myself and basically was living off of basal rates until probably 18 or 19. I realized that it had actually manifested into a slight eating disorder 
Mm-hmm. And so I've also dealt with diabolemia. So okay. it's just kind of like this whirlwind of craziness. It's now- great. <laughs> it's great when your two choices are coma or skin on fire all over my body. Yeah, Those are- exactly. <laughs> coma I mean- actually sounds more pleasurable of the right. two. It really does. It's like I could use a nap, you know. Right. Just, yeah. uh- that's insane. I mean, that's something that personally I've I've never heard of. I I know that for me, the thicker insulins, the older insulins would burn because it was like just injecting cement yes. <laughs> underneath your skin. <laughs> but oh my god! No, like you, you met <sighs> you mentioned you were living off basal rates. That's something I, I I'm not familiar with what that means. Is it so, something? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, so my insulin pump, it runs background insulin that is called your basal rate. And so that changes and fluctuates throughout the day to sort of meet your background insulin needs. Mm -hmm. Um, so what I was doing was jacking up those, the background insulin to keep my blood sugar between like 300 and 600, just enough to not kill me. But just enough to make sure that I could lose enough weight by eating whatever I wanted. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's okay. a big problem, and I was not bring not that a up. healthy way to go, basically. No, and All it's right. also well known eating disorder, diabolemia. Mm-hmm. And it's because, I mean, and I've told you before, and we've talked about it before. When you first get diagnosed, you are just you're pounding back that water. Your kidneys are running nonstop. You're not hungry. I mean, it's not you know you're telling oh, I can't eat that. You're just not hungry. You just don't care enough to eat it. So it can give you, as I'm sure Colleen knows, it can give you crazy health problems if you don't recognize it or work your way through it. So, I mean, for you, when you realized that that was culminating in that eating disorder, what did you do to kind of really put the kibosh on it to try to get yourself in a better place? So I tried three different times of trying Mm -hmm. to like get my crap together. Mm -hmm. Um, And the first time I gained, it was something like 15 or 20 pounds in a month. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, screw this. I'm not doing this. This is dumb. I'm in pain and I gained weight. Yeah. So I gave up. Um, Eventually I found an excellent team at Jocelyn who Mm -hmm. really helped to kind of work with me on slowly lowering my blood sugars, which helped with the weight gain. So I didn't gain as much weight when you lower blood sugar slowly. Mm -hmm. Um, But I remember sitting in the um, diabetes educator's office and crying and telling her, if I gain more than 10 pounds, I'm leaving. Like, I'm not doing this. Mm-hmm. And so that was like my ultimatum and thank God she was awesome enough to continue working with me. Yeah. And we did, we slowly got it down and then my team at Jocelyn fell apart. Mm. So I went, Oh gosh, I don't know. Eight years or so without having a team. And so everything fell apart. Um, mm. And then more recently within the last two years, um, definitely the last six months, I can say that I am in full recovery Good. Um, and so, yeah, it was like, got married, met my husband, got married. Woo-hoo! And then um, after that, it was like, all right, how about we get our stuff together and like do this for a while? So, Very yeah. good on you. Absolutely. Like, yeah. we know what we have to go through. We know the different things that we have to fight. Nothing makes it easier. Not dealing with the doctors or the insurance or the day-to-day stuff. So, I mean, that's that's really, really awesome. Yeah. Now, that, that's something we don't talk about very often. Um, when I met Michelle, what, 20 years ago? Tw- yeah. 2000-ish, right around yeah, there? Yeah, it was 2000. Oh, my gosh. 2000, yeah. Yeah, yeah 2000. And awesome. I, when I first met her is like the week that she got her pump and everything. Yeah. And I got to tell you, when I showed up to meet her, we were going to catch a movie, and she had her <laughs> pump she had just got that day. And being someone, my, my grandmother was the only person I knew at the time with diabetes. And she was an older Italian woman that just always shook her Novolin and, you know, did the needle and had to, had to mix. Yep. Like, I remember being a kid when she had to shake her little bottles. So it kind of threw me, like, just seeing this girl who was half cyborg when I showed up for a date. 
for lack of a better terminology. But I didn't know then how much I should have been. I was a kid myself. I should have been a little bit more understanding of what she was going through. Or I didn't know when we started dating how much diabetes was going to play a role. So when you were just saying you met your husband in the past year is, is, or you got married in the past year, correct? Um, so we've been married for three years in October, met him six okay. years ago, but got my act together in the last like two ish years. Okay. Got okay. It. Is, is he diabetic as well or no? No. Okay. So when you guys met and you started getting serious and dating everything else, did he, was the diabetes thing, uh, anything that he kind of confused him or he just goes, Oh, you're diabetic. Cause with a type two, <laughs> with a type two, like my mom is type two, so she can take her pills or, or take a little bit of insulin here and there. And she can base type two seem like they can basically live their lives and people who live with them might not even know they have type two diabetes with type one. You, you have a schedule and you have a full day. Was it something that is it easier? Is he supportive of everything? Or he just jumped right on board with said, okay, this is what it takes to keep the woman I love alive. Let's figure this all out. Or is he someone that you deal with the diabetes on your own? Or is he a big part of it? So he's a little bit of both. Um, I feel like I'm so unicorny over here. So <laughs> we met by chance one day while he was flying back to his home state of Washington. Mm -hmm. um, and so from there, like we just kind of kept talking via text. We flew back and forth. But like second day that we were talking, I basically unloaded all of my baggage and was like, hey, by the way. <laughs> I have diabetes, I have this, this, that, and the other thing. Oh, so if you still want to talk, like, that's totally cool. But if not, I get it. And so we continued talking. Um, eventually, he moved out here. But I remember on one of our first visits, it was when I went out there, and we were. I was heading to the airport to come home. And I had forgotten to plug my insulin pump back onto me that evening. So I went the entire night without insulin. And I woke up and was like, I don't know how I'm getting on a plane for six hours. I, I don't even know. Like, I think I might need to go to the hospital. Oh, wow. So that was like his first intro to, oh, this is kind of scary. Mm. Um, I didn't go to the hospital, managed to not be in DKA, got myself home. Um, and then once we moved in, I actually, so I have an old insulin pump. I got some saline and I hooked him up to a saline pump. My Did pump. you? And he wore it for, a, uh, was it a week, two weeks, something like that. Um, and yeah, I made him sit there and I was like, okay, count the carbs in dinner. Okay. Oh, nice. So we checked his blood sugar. I'm like, okay, so now what would you do? And so he kind of got to live a little bit of my life. Wow. That's pretty badass. That's, that's really cool. Yeah. yeah. Before I, before I'll wear your ring, you have to wear my pump. That sounds right. like <laughs> <laughs> I just but want that, you to know what you're signing on for. Right. Yeah. And I mean, that's great. What a way to give him an in, a, you know, a really in-depth look mm -hmm. into everything that we have to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Speaking of pumps, we ask this a lot. Uh, what kind of equipment are you pushing over there? Where are you rocking nowadays? So I am rocking um, Tandem with Control IQ and Dexcom. Nice. Okay, so that's what we refer to, or I've heard Michelle refer to as an external pancreas, basically. Closely. You have the, Okay, so the Dexcom is sending the signal right to the pump, and a lot of the day you can just go totally unaware that it's doing all the math for you and everything? So in the background, it does a lot for me. Um, mm -hmm. Again, I was terrified of doing this because I have that allergy to the insulin. So I was terrified yeah. that it was going to start giving me all of these doses of insulin, and I'm just going to be in constant pain. Mm -hmm. so I pushed back with my doctors for a long time on it, and now I feel like an idiot because I probably should have <laughs> just listened to them sooner. Kind of what it should have. I mean, because yeah, I don't, I don't actually feel the background corrections, which is good, awesome. Um, and so again, I, unicorn over here. I have to bolus a little different than everyone else. So, mm -hmm. like Michelle would give herself, you know, three units of insulin for whatever she's eating a couple minutes before she eats. Mm -hmm. I do an extended bolus, so my okay. three units of insulin is extended over 15 minutes. So I mm -hmm. bowl this almost a half an hour ahead of when I eat. Oh wow. Now this is really important because like the extended boluses are really, really great. If I was eating like a 
slice of pizza or something, I would do an extended bolus because it gives me a certain amount of insulin. I tell it what percentage, and then I tell it over the next however long, give me this much. And it'll break it all down, and it'll do it so that that's great. It doesn't give you a huge hit of insulin that's causing you a lot of pain. Yeah. So it's easier with the smaller increments. Yes. With the extended, you don't experience as much painful burning. Correct. Good. Very, mm-hmm. very good. Now, uh, we always ask this too. Uh, for some people, it's easier to get their medicine, their needs. Like right now, I'm not sure if you heard us talking beforehand, but uh, Michelle's going through stuff right now with her insurance company, just getting approved for the Libre and even strips and everything right now. Have have it always been, being that you come from a family of physicians, I imagine they pretty much knew the insurance inside and out and have been able to help you over the years. Have you ever had issues with being able to get what you need when you need it? So I have, I have in the past. Um, there was one point I needed insulin and the insurance denied me. And the letter that they sent me stated that I had been on insulin for too long. And so (laughs) they weren't going to cover it anymore. Oh, my God. Please tell me you laminated that. Like, (laughs) Like, I would have made that place map. Did did you write back? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize my diabetes had been cured. Thanks for the update. (laughs) My pancreas, it's working now. (gasps) Oh, my God. Right. So I ended up calling them. I needed a letter of medical necessity, all of this stuff, finally got insulin. Um, But I think that that's probably the hardest one that I've had to deal with. And that's weird to me, and it's come up before, the fact that you keep needing to re-up your prescription for something that you're going to need for the rest of your life unless there's some sort of miraculous breakthrough. It just seems like, hey, just give me an open-ended, this is what I need, (laughs) need, if we need to you know, up the number of bottles or something significantly, then we can do another one. But we at least know I need this. Why do I keep having to come back and get another piece of paper to say I need this? Why are the prior authorizations only good for a certain amount of time? Exactly. And with a lot of companies, it changes. Like, I just learned that my crappy vendor, who I can't say, but they are found in a park, um, actually rescinded my prior authorization like yeah they just were like no you gotta submit a new one sorry about your luck and they didn't tell me so it was like i kept calling all month going hey you know i really need these libre sensors i'm working off an old you know glucometer and they were like oh your your insurance said no to call my insurance and them go yeah your prior authorized authorization was canceled like i didn't cancel it but that's what they do Mm. That's what they can do is if they don't get the answer right away, they're not going to wait on insurance. They're not going to spend the extra time on it. So they're like, yep, yeah, nope, you're done. Yep. Now, I wanted to ask you both about this. Um, I haven't been able to find a full story on it uh, because right now in the news, it's been a big week, you know, with the unemployment, the new stimulus packet, and everybody's been focused on that. But in the background, I guess uh, the president's also gone ahead and tried to sign in something that's been long awaited, uh, trying to get the price of medication down in the U.S. But specifically, they talked about insulin and opening it up to be able to purchase medicine from Canada. And it, it sounds like a lot of noise right now during an election year because as much as I read it, I get excited because whenever I see something good about diabetes... I first think about Michelle and go, oh, this is going to be great. And then the more you read into it, you get to the bottom of the article. You're like, so nothing's changed yet. Right. Nothing's changed yet. Exactly. And then I think Michelle had mentioned to me that she's like, as the more she read into it right now, as it stated, it's for people who are on Medicare or government insurance, which still wouldn't help someone like Myself. Michelle oh, yeah. or you. Exactly. And I mean, it's one of those things, reading more and more into it, there are going to be very strict guidelines, of course. Mm -hmm. But like I had said to you, Mike, and I might have even posted, it's all, there's no proof in the pudding until it happens. And then even then, Big Farm is going to come in and be like, I'm sorry, how much money are we losing? Oh, no, 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 no. And there's going to be regulations upon, it might what I foresee is there's going to be so many regulations that getting it from Canada, which you can actually just drive to and get a bottle of insulin with no prescription. 
-hmm. So there's that, but there are going to be so many regulations that you're going to be spending the money just for the applications and to get everything approved that you'd be spending if you're still buying it over here. Yeah, I, I think that's, I think you're correct on that because Big Pharma, I looked up about two weeks ago, you know, just through the public information, the representatives that take money from big pharmacy lobbyists. And it's it's not a small number. No. It, no. It's a, and I will say this, um, it's both sides. Democrat yeah, no, it's and not Republican. political. It's not, it's not political. It's just, and some of those checks, every time I see a number reported, I just go ahead and automatically double it in my head. You know, <laughs> kind of like when you were in high school and you were interested in someone, and you asked how many people they slept with. You take that number and you times it by two. You know, <laughs> that's kind of how I feel about people who admit that they're taking 400,000. Because if you're admitting you took 400,000 mm. in cash, you're not talking about the perks and everything else. Exactly. Tax and, cuts that you get uh, for everything. I mean, yeah. And other things they bought for you that that they didn't give cash for. Right. And I guess my question is, why do we even, why should that even be legal? Because I can't think of a good reason to take money from pharmaceutical companies. Because it doesn't seem like any pharmaceutical company is paying off these lobbyists to do things that are good for patients. It's more so not passing legislation like this one specifically, where if you make all your money from jacking up the price of insulin, 300% of what it costs to make it, and then this president all of a sudden says, you know what? I don't think that's fair. I'm going to let them order it from Canada and make it all legal. I think that's exactly where all these donations come into play. Like, hey, I've been paying you this much for the past how many years. You're going to vote no on this, right? Yeah, I, I can agree with that. I mean, we've seen a lot of just different horrible things that have happened to like our of my health care. If it wasn't for the Affordable Care Act, I wouldn't mm -hmm. have insurance. And it's like, because at that point before the Affordable Care Act, insurance companies could just tell you no. Yep. Didn't matter if it was who it was through. They could just be like, yeah, we're not covering you. Or the one that I loved when I got good insurance, I was really excited. And it was so much money. And they're like, yeah, you have to pay that for six months to a year, depending on your medical problems, before we're going to pay anything. Mm -hmm. Now, Colleen, I see you shaking your head a lot. Is that something you went, did the Affordable Care Act help or help you? Like, yes. was it hard to get insured being that you've been a diabetic since you were 13 months old? Did some places just go, we don't cover pre-existing or? So my mom always carried our health insurance um, and she knew that God forbid she ever lost her job or didn't get a job that offered health insurance immediately that I would be dropped and I wouldn't be covered. Mm -hmm. um, because prior to Affordable Care Act, the pre-existing condition automatically gave me the boot. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I was in high school, um, you know, we started to have the conversation, well, what do you want to do for, you know, college and your career? And I was like, oh, I really want to be an artist. And she was like, yeah, well, that doesn't really pay. And that really doesn't have, you know, <laughs> we need for... benefits, honey. Benefits. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, um, I ended up becoming an occupational therapist. And so, you know, the whole thing was, I know that I'll always get paid. I know that I will always have a job and I know that I'll always have health insurance. Mm -hmm. And so it's sad, but true that that was really what helped to kind of navigate where I went with my career was my diabetes. Right. Um, and don't get me wrong. I love my career. <laughs> I love being an OT. Um, but yeah. And then when I was in college, President Obama was elected. And all of a sudden it was like, oh, I don't necessarily have to be an OT. I could, <laughs> I could be that starving artist because mm -hmm. I can be covered under my parents mm -hmm. until I'm 26, mm -hmm. um, which did help me anyways, because I ended up having to get my master's degree. Um, and so I was in school until I was 25. Mm -hmm. um, or 24, something like that. Um, and so when I finally got my first job was right around the time I was turning 26. And so it was like, Oh, perfect good thing. This exists. Yeah. <laughs> that worked out well. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was working for a television station and I'm going back there in September, but when the pandemic hit, uh, we had a conference call and, uh, it was explained to us that we were being laid off. And that we uh, would be getting hired back once it was safe to open the station again. Uh, my first question was, okay, well, are we being laid off or are we being furloughed? Because if we're being furloughed, 
Yeah, I would love to keep my insurance going. I had my family on my insurance and everything else. I was so proud because I've done a bunch of, I went the artist route. So I had a whole bunch of jobs for a lot of my life that didn't have insurance. And then I started working for this TV station. I was like, look at me all responsible with insurance and (laughs) taking care of my family. So they said they were doing a layoff so that we could get the full unemployment benefits. I'm like, well, if you furlough us, we still get the full unemployment benefits, Plus, but you're paying our insurance until we come back. And he said, I'll look into that. And I said, great. And the next day I called my insurance company and it turns out I got, we had that conference call on April 1st. My insurance had ended March 31st. So while we had that conference call, my insurance was already canceled. So for me, it upset me because I was like, well, this this kind of bugs me because as much as people are against universal health care, look at what happened because of what's going on. And because of an order from the government, my job, my company that my insurance was through is shut down. So now I find myself after doing things right in the middle of a health scare pandemic with no health insurance. Yeah. And I thought it was bad for me because I just looked at my kids. I'm like, OK, nobody play with sticks. <laughs> No skateboards <laughs> and nobody get bubble. COVID. Okay, you yep, are yes, <laughs> yes. I'm like that is it. We're gonna put pillows down on the tile. Nobody <laughs> wrestle. I cannot afford for anyone to get in an accident right now. But I thought it was bad for me. But one of the guys I worked with at the station, his son is type one diabetic, and really? to go from the insurance we had was great. No complaints there. I mean, we paid for it, but it was great. Like we had zero deductible. You know, I would go to the doctor just because I'm like, I got a day off. Let's go check out what's going on over here. (laughs) Um, It's free. Why not? Let's go. Um, But to lose that all for me, it was like, okay, as long as nothing happens, we'll be fine. And I put the kids back on Florida Kid Care, which is a great service. Oh, my Um, God. I do love that. But for him, he went overnight from we have insurance and we're covered to where am I going to come up with $1,300 a month for my kid's insulin? Because Mm -hmm. like Michelle, his kid can't do the Walmart insulin or nobody should, I guess. The more I do these, the more I learn everybody should just stay away from Walmart (laughs) insulin. Everybody should just stay away from Walmart. Let's just leave it at that. But, um, But just how scary that is to go from, Hey, by the way, you lost your job. So you don't know when money's coming in. And a lot, I mean, 60% 60% of the families uh, in America live paycheck to paycheck, if not more. So automatically, you're losing your pay. You don't know when your unemployment is going to kick in. And you just picked up a $1,200 a month minimum medical bill. Yeah. So it hopefully that's it. And I mean, that, that right. might just be the insulin. That might not even include the glucometer strips, yeah. which right. they doubled in price. Like the freestyle ones that I was using, you used to get 100 for $100. Mm-hmm. And now it's a hundred for two hundred dollars, fifty for a hundred dollars, and it's like, why you didn't make the strips any better? They <laughs> nope. threw a stupid butterfly on it. That's all they did, and yep. it cost me double. Yeah, it's stupid, and it's sad, and it's really sad for your well, friends. The, the more I've read into it, it's it's ridiculous how specifically insulin companies work. Like you basically got your three big insulin companies, mm-hmm. right? And the guy who invented insulin, there's a quote that I love from him where he basically says, I, I can't charge for it. It's for everybody. Yep. You know, yep. Dr. These three, Frederick Banting. Look, mm-hmm. at, look at that. You got yeah. like Banting groupies. 1922. Right? So, yeah. so here's, here's a guy who's like, no, this is what people need. And then these three companies came along and said, we're going to take that <laughs> and we're going to find a way to become millionaires off it. And they and, did. And then... You're not allowed to patent it, obviously, no. uh, but the procedures they have for making it is where they get away with, oh, that's our patent for our procedure. We put the water in after we put the, you know, it's like yeah. grandma's mm-hmm. recipe. Like I use two things You're of salt. You're supposed to sift it. No, so stir it. it. It's crazy because what they do to delay anyone coming into the insulin market is they'll go ahead and go to court with all those patents to make sure they're not using their procedure for making this thing that's been around for hundreds of years or however long. But then also what they'll do is they'll go to companies trying to come into the market and go, look, we know you want to come into the market. And here's what's going to cost you to set up your labs and your buildings and employees and overhead. Or we can just write you this check right now. The bigger insulin companies will actually pay upstart companies not to start selling insulin. Mm -hmm. 
which of course makes it much easier to go to you guys and go, well, yeah, no, of course we got jack up prices because we just had to pay this other company not to come into the business. And <laughs> exactly. it just, it just kills me because when you think of monopolies, like when they talk about broadcasting and communications, mm -hmm. the government's first to come in and go, no, you can't own all these news sources. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to like insulin for diabetics, <laughs> they're like, yeah, screw, screw them over. Do what, yeah. do what you got to do. Just send us 400 grand a year and we're good. I mean, and then you can always, you can always fall back on crappier insulins. I mean, that's always, and it always seems to me that like, so for me, Novolog doesn't work at all. Humalog works, but Novolog is like injecting myself with water. And they'll, my insurance will cover Novolog. They won't cover Humalog. And it's like, but I have all this information that says it's bad. And they're like, yeah, no, we're going to need a new year's worth of clinical notes from your doc. You go, okay. Is it good? It's good. Well, girl, we can trade because mine doesn't cover Novolog. It covers Are you Novolog serious? And, you know, that one works better for me. So wow. have you tried Fios? Yeah, Sorry, no, what? totally. Wow. Have you Maybe. tried Fios? No. F-I-A-S-P, all caps. And it's like Novolog. It's, it's made by the same company, but it works for me where Novolog doesn't, Interesting. which is really, really weird. But yeah, no, I it, it's funny because kind of Mich Michelle has like her insurance approved the pen, but not the cartridges that go into the pen. So I use an insulin pen. Absolutely love it. My insulin pen uh, Bluetooths to my phone. It tells it oh. how much insulin I've given, when I've given it, what's my insulin on board, just like a pump would. And they cover Fios, they just don't cover Fios in cartridges. They cover it in stupid disposable pens, but not, uh, I'm like, it's, it's a different storage device. It's the same expensive liquid, right. just <laughs> in a different package. Nope, nope, won't cover it. You know what we should do? We should do like in like Sundays in like little downtown areas. They got those farmers and swap meets. We should just set up a diabetic swap meet where everybody has their little booth. You get everything you can from the insurance every month, but then you yeah. set it up on the table, <laughs> stuff it. you can't use, and then it'll be Let's like barter. all barter. Let's go back. Yeah, and forth. like all medieval England, money. people just in the market yeah. arguing over like I'll give you two pens for a vial. <laughs> no, I also need fifty each. And you, yeah. you're gonna have the guys in the back doing the back room. Dexcom re up <laughs> and changing the batteries yeah, and making it. Exactly. Yeah. And then you got the other guy with a oh. little sticker booth putting on whatever you want Perfect. on your Dexcom. Yeah. Perfect. I like it. I like it. It's we'll good. be all, yeah. <laughs> Whole we'll dysotopic right diabetic stairs. community. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like steampunk for diabetics. I like it. <laughs> it's great. So, Colleen, we, we always ask people on the show, like, um, growing up, did you have other friends who were also type one so they were understanding or were you, were you the one in your group that your friends were always kind of like, oh, I don't know how you can do that. I can you never do needles. Like, oh, don't do that Halloween. in front of me. Oh, you make me you feel don't so get weird. get Valentine's Day candy. Uh -huh. Yeah. So my friends were always really good when I was a kid um, because I was so knowledgeable at such a young age. And so, you know, like I'd run around the playground giving diabetes lectures. Like, oh, this is what you should do. <laughs> awesome. <Awesome. laughs> You know, and like, you know, my parents would come over and give me my nighttime insulin mm -hmm. um, at sleepovers and all the girls would come running over like, whoa, she's going to get a needle. That's crazy. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. And so like as a kid, that was fun and fine. But mm -hmm. I was alone. It was just me. Um, right. I didn't know anyone in town or even like mm -hmm. in the area that had it. Um, mm -hmm. And then I ended up going to... Um, Claire Barton camp. So I met a couple of people through that. Uh, and then again, pre Facebook and Instagram and all that. So I didn't really get to keep contact. So mm. once the online community came about, it was like this whole world got open to me. It was so nice to see other people that like understand what I'm going through. Mm -hmm. It was totally world changing. Right. I have to say, I agree with that. I mean, social media has for me done the same. Like, mm -hmm. I didn't know a lot of diabetics. You know, I knew one girl in my entire high school. It was one of those things that really, really helped because you can just go on and be like, well, shit, I forgot to bolus for breakfast this morning. You know, I thought I did. And apparently, <laughs> my blood sugar is telling me that's a lie. 
How many how, how many times have you had people say things to you like, well, maybe if you didn't eat so much sugar or like it, it's all about your diet or we always ask what's what's basically have you had anyone offer you up ways to cure your diabetes? Yes. And I've only <laughs> had that more so as an adult. Yes. Um, and I've noticed it more since I've been wearing I wear my Dexcom on my arm. I had Libre too, so I wore that on my arm. Um, and I wear my pump on my arm as well. And so people will ask all the time, like, what is that thing on your arm? And I get <laughs> nice people that are like, can I ask you something personal? But then you get rude people that are like, what is that thing? I had someone try to rip it off once. That was Oh, oh. Um, oh death. I tell them, I get, you know, something along the lines of like, oh, well, you don't look that overweight. And it's like... Oh, yeah. Uh, okay great thank you you know <laughs> or you know oh I actually I had a student at one point and a patient asked me what it was on my arm and I told them you know constant glucose monitor I'm a juvenile mm -hmm. diabetic blah 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 she turns and looks at the student and goes this is why you need to stay healthy and I was floored this kid without missing a Beat. He goes, well, she's had it since birth, so she didn't do anything wrong. Nice. I nice. There like, you go. Okay, we'll keep you around. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I've, wow. I've gotten it more so as an adult than I did as a kid. I feel like that's just about the equivalent of walking up to someone who's dying of cancer in hospice going, probably should have hit the gym a couple more times a week, huh? You know? Yeah. <laughs> like. That would have done it. Yeah, next time someone asks you what's on your arm, just look at it and get, like, really shocked. Like, oh, what the Where'd that come from? You know, wasn't there when I woke up? <laughs> right. Yeah. It. I mean. Yeah. People it's, used to ask me. God. Oh, people used to ask me like, "Why do you have a pop socket stuck to your arm?" <laughs> I'm like, well, it's not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's great. That's okay. When I when I first saw Michelle with her pump clipped her, I was like, "This girl's rocking a beeper. She's right. one of those old school people." Yeah, I like it. <laughs> Oh. Well, I mean, it's it's one of those things. It's been really awesome talking to you and getting to hear about your experience and how you're taking control of your health, and that's great. Um, I mean, what do you hope to see? Like, obviously, a cure, but what do you hope to see in like the next? Okay, only two years. I'm not giving them five. Two years with the diabetes community, like. Is there, are there any improvements? I would love to see the eyelet come out, the true, fully automated, um, automatic pancreas. The one that that guy made that his son had diabetes mm -hmm. and it was in, it was, I mean, it was a main, was it a main? I can't remember. I can't remember. But it was this guy and he, he was like a brilliant engineer. His wife was a doctor and their kid was type one. Mm -hmm. And so he built, and it's the closed loop system. It's better than the tandem and the IQ, which uh, honestly is one of the best on the line right now. Mm -hmm. But it literally, you don't have to do a thing. You don't, you just, you attach it to yourself and that's it. It runs yep. everything. It checks everything. It'll give you sugar. It'll give you insulin. It's amazing. And, it acts and, like a pancreas. And how is that different now than the tandem Dexcom pumps? Because I thought that's exactly what the Dexcom with the pump did. How is that different? The Dexcom can suspend, can tell the pump, and please correct me if I'm wrong on this because I'm just learning about the tandem. It can stop the basal, the background insulin, if mm -hmm. it feels that you're going low. Okay. So it'll stop that. And in suspending that, your blood sugar will automatically rise. And then okay. once it rises, it'll turn it back on. Mm -hmm. Yep. And okay. so the difference with the islet is that it includes glucagon in it. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't, it doesn't just suspend it. It treats the low as oh. well. Yeah. So okay. glucagon, remember that big scary needle I used to have? Uh -huh. Came in an orange plastic case. Mm -hmm. That was a glucagon. And it's basically just like the sugar upon sugar upon sugar injected right into you. It takes yeah, action I, immediately. I never wanted to deal with it because I always pulp fiction always came to mind. You know, like Which, and I told and you over and over out. that's not where you stab it. And and I and apparently I found out this year that's not where you put Narcon. 
anytime. Like that was just <laughs> You don't you don't take a needle and put it through the breastbone. Uh, you don't. Yeah, it's not the way adrenaline. it works. That's it's all about the, the adrenaline. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, well, that and that was uh, a guy who made it for his son, son, and his wife's a doctor. So I might be sketchy. He might be the doctor. No, mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure he's the engineer and his wife's the doctor. So, is this something that since? It seems to be working, has been put into development, or is this another thing where Big Pharma just kind of came and wrote a check and said, hey, it would cost you a lot of money to put this out on the market. <laughs> Take this instead, and uh, congrats to you and your son. It's in trials. Last I read, is it, it was still yep. in trials. And the thing is, they'll keep it in trials for a long, 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 yeah. long time. And that's how Big Pharma will be like, no, no, we'll pay. Don't worry. You need, you need... 250 people to try this? Yeah, no problem. We got an office out back. We'll just funnel them through. Whereas he is on a lot smaller scale. Even mm. getting donations and stuff like that, you're still not raking in yeah. the bazillions of dollars yeah. that they are. Well, Colleen, we always ask uh, people on the show if you could go back in time and give yourself some advice when you're first diagnosed. But being 13 months... <laughs> I, I I don't even know where to go as far as let, let's take it a step further. Uh, say, say there's someone um, 10, 11, 12 kid first diagnosed type one diabetes. Is there any advice that you would give them that you wish you kind of knew when you were that age that would make things a bit easier for them? So that actually happened to me. Um, oh, really? My, one of my good friends in college, her son was diagnosed about a year and a half ago now. Um, at the age of seven, it was just after his seventh birthday. And I got the t- the Facebook message at like two in the morning. I'm in the ER. I think my son has type one. And, you know, she and I start chatting in the morning and I'm sitting there bawling like this is my kid. And mm-hmm. it was just such a bizarre experience because all of a sudden it's I'm going, oh, this is happening to somebody that I know and they're really young. And this mm-hmm. is weird to kind of re visit where I was Mm -hmm. um and so it was really interesting so he got hooked up with um an insulin pump and Dexcom like within the first couple of months that he was diagnosed wow and um so he and I I sent him a bunch of stickers for it and like all these fun little things (laughs) and you know she and I talk frequently like hey what would you do about you know cereal here and I'm like "Mm, I kind of just eat it but you're still new so (laughs) try something different Mm -hmm. um but so we actually got to meet up with our son um at diabetes conference and it was really cool to just see like another kid and hey I'm gonna I'm the adult version of you know (laughs) what happens like I'm married and I have friends and we're cool so (laughs) we we actually had Tracy Herbert on the show last week. I don't know if you've heard of uh, Tracy before. She she was diagnosed with diabetes when she was, I believe, 16. Yeah. And she's had it for uh, about 40 years now. And she rode her bike cross-country as a diabetic uh, and actually rode right on the stage of Dr. Oz's studio. And uh, she really lives the life of wanting to show everybody that just because you have type 1 doesn't mean life is over for you Mm -hmm. but one of the charities that she runs is actually making sure that children who are diagnosed with type 1 automatically get access to the technology that she didn't have Mm -hmm. like she told us when she was diagnosed they actually gave her disposable needles but still taught her how to boil needles because they didn't think disposable needles were going to be around so she was checking her urine for a parameter blood sugar and things like that i mean so the more and more I do these, and I know Michelle didn't have access to um, something like Dexcom. Uh, she did have the pump and everything starting out. Uh, you, since you were having this since you were 13 months old, how old were you when you first got hooked up with like a pump and a Dexcom? When was that made available to you? Um, so I was 14, I think, when I got hooked up with, um, my insulin pump. Mm-hmm. And then when Libre came out in the UK, mm-hmm. I actually was buying it off, of, <laughs> buying it off of eBay. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and so I was paying out of pocket for a Libre to get it into the States. And then the States got Libre. So then I was getting it through them. And then I tried 
Dexcom when it was the G4, so a couple of years back, mm -hmm. and I hated it. The insertion part thing was terrible. <laughs> no, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, and then it's been four months since I've been back on Dexcom with the Control IQ. Cool. And my A1C so, has gone down three points. Wow. So is looking back now, if I know you said at first you didn't like the Dexcom when it first came out and stuff like that, but looking back now, is this all technology that you would have preferred if you had the choice how many years earlier or or were you fine with the needles and the testing and everything else? So I was fine with it. Mm -hmm. um, and I know I have an unpopular opinion on this, but I feel like new diabetic patients should not necessarily get, and I'm going to get beaten for this, not necessarily get um, like technology right away because I feel like then they don't learn sort of the yep. ins and outs of, okay, technology does fail. It does break. Yeah. And what do you do in that circumstance? Mm -hmm. um, I have you know, to say I so, completely agree. Yeah. And so, you know, I, you know, I don't want kids to suffer. I don't want adults to suffer, no. but it's like, if you don't know the ins and outs of it, how do you navigate those challenging situations? So you if feel you've never had a sliding scale or right. had to, you know, do all all of it in your head, or thankfully now there's a calculator on everything. Right. But I mean, if you had it, paper. that would, yeah, exactly. It, it's one of those things I can, yeah, I understand, mm -hmm. and I see why my doctors wouldn't let me get a pump until I was almost nineteen, yeah. because they they said we want you to have a couple of years of just doing your own stuff. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so basically definitely let the kids have the technology because it makes life sim simpler and a little more bearable. But at the mm -hmm. same time, they need to have the education of how to take care of themselves and not rely so much on it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Or at least have the Dexcom. I mean, they yeah. should be able to have the Dexcom because as a kid, you're not always going to understand what – the when the lows can creep up on you mm -hmm. and things like that and that it, I can't imagine how it had to have been for my parents. I mean, I was sixteen, but still to know that they would see my sugars hit thirties mm -hmm. and it was how scared does that have to be to go to bed that night and right. not worry something else going to happen? So I think it sh it should be made definitely the CGM should be made for every. New, old, doesn't matter. Everybody should get them because it's the yeah. most helpful thing that you can have. Definitely. All right, right. Well, Colleen, it has been great talking to you. And thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us. Is there anything you want to, uh, anything you want to put out there, any advice, anything like that before we let you go tonight? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> take, take as best care of yourself as you can. You know, if you find yourself getting into burnout or randomly have pain, don't sit and wait on that for years. You know, talk to your doctor right away about anything that you're experiencing. Um, you know, diabulimia is known sort of in our community, but not necessarily with doctors. So, you know, look up some of that information, have some of that information for them, help somebody, you know, kind of learn something and help others. Yeah, um, that was Honestly, the first time I've heard of diabulimia, and I worked at a pharmaceutical company for two years. So the fact that we've mentioned it before on the show, the fact that I worked in a company where I was able to communicate with doctors and communicate with insurance companies and send out insulin and needles and everything or to not. diabetics and still know nothing about it <laughs> proves that there's a big problem in the industry. It really does. <laughs> So, uh, Michelle, anything you want to ask Colleen before we get um, going tonight? You know, craziest thing. What What's supposed to cure you? Give me the craziest thing. Somebody's not eating better or exercising, but like. We've had we've what? Had cinnamon. Seeds, cinnamon. Apple, apple cider, cider vinegar. vinegar. Mm -hmm. um, oh, God. There was another one. I'm not remembering it. Uh, I can't remember. Oh, uh, Next segue. Time. While Colleen's thinking about this. Yeah. Uh, did you guys see the big video that was going viral today? The bunch of doctors standing outside the Supreme Court talking about COVID-19. And a ton of people were reposting, see this? These are real doctors saying that 
hydrochloronique <laughs> actually cures oh COVID. And then oh. they pulled up a video of one of the main doctors. And she also has a video where she's saying that if you have certain diseases, it's because you had sex with demons in your dreams. And wow. that a lot of times we can't cure things. It's because we have alien DNA running around inside us. Which I, I always said on, I was out of this world. I've this watched Ancient it. Aliens. I'll give her that one. But sex with <laughs> demons in your dreams. I'm like, man, can I get someone else on my HMO plan? This is kind of. <laughs> man, my Catholic school really screwed yeah. up then on that one. Yeah, Jesus. Really? Yeah. So we, we, should get, we should get her on the show to see what would cure diabetes. <laughs> it's probably hydrochloronique. Chlorine? Chloroquine? I don't know. It's but, a hydro uh, stuff. So, Colleen, have you had any um, suggested remedies that might seem out of the world? Yeah. Um, so, ice showers, ice cold showers <laughs> was what was going to cure my diabetes. Now, let me tell you, oh. I live mm -hmm. in Cape Cod. I spent my entire, like, spring break in April swimming mm -hmm. in the ocean. Okay? Mm -hmm. it's cold. Yeah. There, there's no cure here. Oh, God. That, that, me, I, I would have done it. Ice cold showers. When I think how many of those I took when I was 13, 14, maybe that's the reason I'm not diabetic right now. You know? <laughs> that could be it. Because there were a lot. Yeah. But well, Colleen, <laughs> thank you so much for being on the show and thanks for your insight on everything. It was it was kind of cool to be able to talk to someone who actually had a family of people with medical experience because most of the people we've talked to, you know, we we had one girl on the show that her mom, when she was diagnosed with diabetes, they almost took the approach of, if I ignore it, it will go away. So that was her life for 14 years. So it's awesome to talk to someone who actually was diagnosed with something. Their parents knew how to support it right from the get-go. Uh, Michelle, anything else before we get going tonight? No, it's been a pleasure talking to you and hearing everything. And I look forward to all of your posts because your memes make me laugh really, really hard. So, <laughs> and, you know, I hope I hope everything works out. I hope that you know, you continue taking great care of yourself and that we don't have to overthrow the government anytime soon because 2020. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Might not be a bad idea anyway. Just saying. Just in case. 2020. Yeah. It's the year. <laughs> it is <All> right. the year. <laughs> well, Colleen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank we you appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. Now that you've woken up the Hey